Today we're going to continue our discussion of probabilistic inference with variational inference. Variational inference, like Gibbs sampling that we talked about last time, is a way of inferring hidden variables in a model. Unlike Gibbs sampling, which is an instance of Markov chain Monte Carlo inference, variational inference is deterministic. That is, there's no randomness that you get from the Monte Carlo aspect of MCMC algorithms. Unlike MCMC algorithms, variational inference also has easy to gauge convergence. It's clear when you've stopped and reached an answer. And unlike MCMC algorithms that require thousands of iterations, variational inference typically only requires dozens of iterations. Gibbs sampling also has strict conjugacy requirements. However, variational inference, while it benefits from conjugacy, doesn't have that strict requirement. And while there are other MCMC algorithms that don't require conjugacy, such as Metropolis Hastings, they're typically fairly difficult to implement or take a long time to converge. The downside of variational inference is that the math involved is slightly more difficult, and thus it takes longer to implement than Gibbs sampling. So let's talk about the general setup. This should be a bit of a review. We have some observations x, some hidden variables z, and some parameters alpha. And we want to figure out what the posterior distribution is. What is the most likely distribution over our latent variables given our observation and parameters? So for example, for a Gaussian mixture model, our data are the x's and we have latent variables z and mu, the cluster assignments and the cluster means. But the posterior for Gaussian mixture models is intractable for large n. And if you want to add priors to the model, expectation maximization that we talked about before for Gaussian mixture models simply doesn't work. This is because you have to consider all of the means, all of the cluster assignments, and it becomes computationally intractable. To address this, what we're going to do is create a variational distribution, and this is why this method is called variational inference. A variational distribution is a distribution over all of your latent variables parameterized by variational parameters. In this case, we'll use the letter nu. And we want to choose nu the parameters of this variational distribution so that the variational distribution q is close to the posterior. If the family of variational distributions that we're using, i.e. the particular family of distributions, the same parameterization holds for both q and p, then this just is vanilla expectation maximization. That is, if for every element in your generative process p, you have a matching q with the same parameterization, we just have em. What's different is when q is chosen to be in some way simpler than your true distribution. On the previous slide, I mentioned that we wanted the distributions to be close to each other. So what does it mean for two distributions to be close? So we'll measure the closeness of distributions using something called kullback leibler divergence, or just Kale divergence for short. And this is defined by this equation. So let's stare at this equation for a bit. And you'll notice that if q and p are high, then you get a low divergence. That means that they're close to each other. If q is high, but p isn't, then we pay a price. Whenever q is low, since it's in the numerator, we don't care what's going on. And you'll notice that if the Kale divergence is exactly zero, then the distributions are equal. That is, you have the expectation of the log of one, which is zero, and so everything is zero. 
And so you'll notice that this is not symmetric. And we don't care about places where uh, P is high but Q is not. And so what we're really looking for is a solution, not every solution. We don't want to match P exactly, but the answer that we get out for Q should match some regions of P relatively well. And this is often called mode splitting, where we're just choosing one solution out of several. Before we get to the derivation of variational inference, I want to quickly go over a mathematical inequality that we'll be using. Jensen's inequality is an inequality that we can apply to concave functions. What Jensen's inequality says is that if you have two points, x1 and x2, for instance, and you average the function f, that's concave, evaluated at those two points, that will be less than the function applied to the average of those two points. And we can see that graphically here. The line corresponds to all of the ways that you can take a weighted average of x1 and x2 where the function f has been applied to it. And so that corresponds to this point here and this point here. The weighted average of those two points lies on the line connecting them. If you consider the function applied to the average of those points, that function must lie above that line because that function is concave. And so a concave function forms an arch connecting those two points. And so any average of the two points in x, x1 and x2 will lie in this range and the function will be strictly above that line. And this generalizes to more than just two points, it generalizes to expectations, which are a probabilistic weighted average of points. In particular, if you have a concave function f, the concave function applied to an expectation will be greater than or equal to the expectation of that function. And if you haven't seen this before, spend 15 minutes to convince yourself that it's true. So let's use the instance inequality now. And we'll first start off with the log probability of data. And you'll remember that this is something that we often want to try to maximize. We want to figure out settings of parameters or latent variables that maximize this value. So let's just expand the probability of our data by considering the integral over all possible latent variables z. This is just marginalization. And then we'll do something a little bit funny. We'll multiply this by 1. But we're going to write 1 in a very odd way, just the ratio of our variational distribution q divided by itself. So this is still mathematically true. Those just cancel out and are 1. But when we write it like this, we can take the q and consider that an expectation because we're taking an integral over all of our latent variables and our variational distribution is a distribution over the same set z. And so we can just take the integral over z of q times some quantity and then just call that the expectation under q of what's left, which is just the probability of x comma z divided by q of z, so that becomes the argument of the expectation. So now, let's break up the two terms and apply Jensen's inequality. So first we'll apply Jensen's inequality to flip the expectation and the log. And then the second thing that we'll do is use the fact that log of a divided by b is equal to log of a minus log of b. So when we do those two things, 
we now get this inequality that the log probability of our data is greater than or equal to the expectation under Q of our joint probability, so the probability of x comma z, minus the expectation under Q of the log probability of our latent variables under Q. One interesting side effect is that the second term here is just equal to the entropy of our variational distribution. The other thing is that if we maximize our variational distribution, that serves as a lower bound to our log probability. So normally when we do inference, we want to maximize our log probability, but now we're going to do something slightly different and maximize this augmented form of the expectation of the joint probability under the variational distribution, and that turns out to be basically the same thing, modulo this entropy term. So just to remind you, this is the entropy term here. And the goal of the algorithms that we'll develop is to maximize this quantity, which serves as a surrogate for our log probability. So instead of just operating on a lower bound, we can also think about this as minimizing the KL divergence between P and Q. So let's first start off with the definition of conditional probability, and then we'll fit this into the definition of Kale divergence between P and Q. So first, let's take the Kale divergence and then just plug that into the definition. And so that's an expectation under Q of the log of the ratio of the variational distribution over your latent variables divided by the conditional likelihood of the latent variables given your observations. So we'll break this log into two parts because it's a division. And now we have a difference of logs under the expectation of Q. And then we'll just put in the definition of conditional probability. So we take this definition, apply it to this term, and then that gives us another difference which turns into these terms here. And this is a plus because this was overall a minus before. So now what we'll do is we'll reorganize the terms a little bit. The expectation of Q goes away on this last term here because there's no Q here. And so now we have the overall log probability, which we can get rid of because it's a constant. And then we have what we had before. We have the entropy term of the variational distribution and the expectation of the log joint with respect to the variational distribution. Thus far, we've been talking about the variational distribution in a very abstract way. It's just a distribution over the latent variables. But we haven't really described what it is yet. So let's say that we have a variational distribution. One way of writing a variational distribution is what's called the mean field uh, variational distribution, where all of your latent variables are independent, and the joint is just the product of each of the marginals. This obviously doesn't contain the true posterior, so P is definitely not equal to Q, because in the original P, the hidden variables are dependent on each other. That's how you define the generative story of how you believe your data came to be, but that is now gone. When we actually do variational inference, a big part of the algorithm is choosing what variational distribution to use. And this is how it's a bit of an art. And so the mean field distribution is a fine place to start. Sometimes it doesn't work, and you need to rethink what the variational distribution should be. And this is where it becomes a bit more of an art and less of a science, a lot like the construction of deep networks like we talked about before. 
But once you've chosen a variational distribution, for example, the mean field distribution, you can derive your objective function, the elbow that we talked about before, then do coordinate ascent on each of the individual variational distributions, and then you repeat until you converge. And so just like k-means or expectation maximization, we keep updating our variational parameters until they stop changing, and then we're done. So let's go through an example of doing variational inference on topic models that uh, you all know and presumably love by this point. So remember, we want to discover these topics. This is one part of the generative process. You also have, for each document, a distribution over topics. We can represent that as a point on the simplex of multinomial distributions. And then the final latent variable is the assignment of tokens to individual topics. So when we did Gibbs sampling, we conditioned the distribution of one word on all of the others, and now we're going to create a variational distribution to capture both this latent variable and the latent variable that is the distribution over topics for each document. So just to refresh your memory of the entire generative process, for each topic, we have a multinomial distribution over words. Each document also gets a multinomial distribution over topics drawn from a Dirichlet distribution. And then each word has a topic assignment drawn from the document's topic distribution. And then finally, we have the observed word drawn from one of the topics. When we write the joint out, each of these terms has a probabilistic form based on the family of distributions that it comes from. So the probability of getting a particular distribution over topics theta from a Dirichlet is given by this equation. Getting a particular topic assignment from the multinomial is given by this equation. And then getting an individual word drawn from a topic is given by this equation. So now we have the complete joint, and we can plug this in to our objective function that we want to optimize with variational inference. But first we need to imagine our variational distribution, and this is just going to be a mean field distribution, where all of the thetas for each document are independent, as are all of the topic assignments. And we're going to say that this is a Dirichlet distribution because theta is a multinomial, and multinomials come from Dirichlet. And we're going to say that the topic assignments come from a multinomial because discrete random variables come from multinomials. So let's take a look and start expanding these terms. The variational distribution, as we said before, has two components. One is a Dirichlet, one is a multinomial. Here I've explicitly written the products out to make it a little more precise. And our variational distributions are both vectors. The difference is that a Dirichlet distribution doesn't have to sum to one. While it is non-negative, the Dirichlet distribution can be any real valued number. The variational token distribution over topic assignments, however, is a multinomial distribution, and it does have to sum to one. So we're going to have a theta, and thus a gamma for every document, and we're going to have a phi for every token. And this is what we're going to keep updating as we go through variational inference. So now that we have our variational distribution, we can start taking expectations. And so the expectation of a Dirichlet is the hardest one that we'll have to do. And if you want to look at this, uh, the Murphy book has some pointers, as does the original LDA paper. You can look up uh, what's happening with this. Uh, but hopefully you can sort of see how this is happening. The original uh, Dirichlet distribution had this ratio of gamma functions. 
that looks something like this. And hopefully you can see that if you take the log of this, you would get something uh, that has a similar form. And you have this new funky function uh, that you didn't have before. This is uh, the digamma function, first derivative of log gamma. With the expectation of the Dirichlet in hand, we can now start taking expectations of our actual model. So first, let's look at the expectation of the distribution over topics for a given document. And so we break this into different components. So this is the normalizer of the Dirichlet. And then we have the actual theta vector over here. And so we can break this into sums, because these are just products. The log of an exponent can come down. And so we do that on uh, the second term. For the first term, we're just going to break this up into a log gamma form and leave it at that, because this is a constant. Given alpha, you can just compute that. And then uh, we're plugging in uh, the previous slide here for the expectation of a log Dirichlet. And then we get this digamma term. And again, uh, you can take this on faith if you don't want to look it up. Uh, it requires some knowledge about exponential families, but you can just keep this as a formula. This is the first expectation. Now let's go to a simpler expectation, the expectation of the topic assignment given your document distribution over topics. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to turn products into sums and move the log inside. We've uh, used linearity of expectation to move the expectation inside. And the expectation of this indicator function is just how much your variational distribution said, what is the probability of this token being assigned to a particular topic? So this indicator function in P becomes the variational distribution over your topic assignments in Q. So remember, Q is a distribution over assignments of your latent variables. Zn is one of those latent variables. And this is just going over all of the options for whether Zn takes on a value. And the variational distribution has an answer of how much does this token take on this topic assignment. And then you're left with the expectation of a log Dirichlet. And we plug in that formula again with the digamma functions. OK, so now let's move on to another expectation, the expectation of a word given a topic assignment and the topic. So remember, the topic assignment is a discrete outcome, and the topic is a distribution over words. So this is just looking up a particular value of beta for a topic assignment and whatever the identity of the word is, whether it's dog or cat or bagel. And so that's just a single probability. And we take the log of it. So we're going to make this a little bit more complicated to include all possible topics and all possible topics. And then this is just an indicator function that says, is, does this index of the topic distribution match whatever word you're using here? So is this dog, is this cat, or is this bagel? And was this token assigned to this topic? And so uh, we can take uh, the exponent of a log outside, restrict the expectation to remove the log term here, because that doesn't depend on the variational distribution. The variational distribution just governs theta and z. And so now, 
we have this indicator function considering all of the possible topic assignments. And so when we simplify that, that's just the probability of this token taking on a topic times a simple function that basically says is word d in, so look at document D, the nth word in that document is that matching this because we're doing a sum over all of the possible words and then this is your expectation. So we finished all of our expectations but we still have these entropy terms at the end. So remember the objective function has both the expectation of the joint with respect to Q but also the entropy of the variational distribution. So you can look up these entropies from Wikipedia. The entropy of a Dirichlet takes on this form. The entropy of a multinomial is much simpler. It's just phi times log of phi. And so now we're done. We can take a look at the full expectations and entropies. So we have the entropies down here. And then we have the full expectations of the joint up here. And this gives us our complete objective function. So this looks like a huge mess, but we're going to do something very similar to what we did for logistic regression. We're going to take the gradient with respect to individual parameters, set it equal to zero, and then solve for what the new value should be. And we'll do that for each of our variational parameters, gamma, phi, and our global parameters, beta, the topics. We can go even further. You can do the same thing for alpha if you wanted to optimize your hyperparameters, but we won't do that today. And so the overall blueprint, just to repeat, is we compute the partial derivative of our objective function with respect to each variable of interest. In this case, it's gamma, phi, and beta. We'll set it equal to zero and then solve for that variable. So the derivative of the elbow for phi is this term here. So most terms don't involve phi whatsoever, so those go away entirely. You have it proportional to this. This is because the only phi you have in here is inside this log. And many of the terms go away and are subsumed into this proportional to sign here. So this is our complete update. And you'll notice this looks a lot like the Gibbs sampling function that we had before. We have one term here that says how much does this topic like the word, and one term here that says how much does this document like this topic. And it's getting modulated through this exp of digamma functions, but it's still doing the same thing as the document term did in Gibbs sampling. So now let's do the same thing for gamma. We take the derivative with respect to gamma, and we get this. And so here we had the digamma function. We now have the derivative of the digamma function. But even though we have these messy symbols here, the update is actually quite simple. You can look at this and see that the only way for this to be zero is if these terms here are equal to be zero. And so we can just solve this for a zero, and then we get that gamma has to be equal to alpha plus the sum of all the fees. How much does this document like a particular topic? And so here you take the expected count with respect to the variational distribution of how much does every word use a particular topic, add them all up across all of the words, and then add in this pseudo count alpha. So remember, you can think because of conjugacy of the Dirichlet priors as a pseudo count that you add to your actual multinomial distributions. We did this for Gibbs sampling, and so we'll do the same thing here. Gamma is just our pseudo count of the Dirichlet parameter plus how much we see each of the individual words. The update for beta is a little bit more complicated. It requires doing a Lagrange parameter like we did before for support vector machines. But the solution is obvious once you get it. The 
probability of seeing a particular word in a topic is just proportional to the sum of how many times you saw that word take on a topic assignment. So again, you're taking the expected counts under the variational distribution, normalizing them, and that gives you your topics. So now the overall algorithm looks something like this. You randomly initialize the variational parameters. They can't be uniform. That's a local optimum. So you need to use some sort of randomness to initialize those variational parameters. And then for each iteration, you update gamma and phi one at a time. Then for the entire corpus, you update your topic distribution beta. You then compute your objective function just to make sure that you haven't screwed anything up. And then your final answer is just the expectation of the variational parameters at the last iteration. So as we wrap up our discussion of variational inference, it's helpful to step back and think about how this is different or similar to Gibbs sampling, what we talked about last time, and work through for topic models. So recall that for Gibbs sampling, you are sampling from the conditional distribution of a variable after you've conditioned on all of the other variables. So for example, all of the other topic assignments in a document and across all documents to sample the conditional distribution of a single token assignment. Variational inference isn't all that different. You have a variational distribution that's set to the exponentiated log of the conditional of the other variables. So in practice, it isn't that different. Implementation-wise, variational is often more difficult to implement, but easier to scale up. And we'll talk about in class some of the ongoing research that's allowing variational inference to scale to very large data sets through online inference or through parallelization. Gibbs sampling or MCMC in general is much more difficult to parallelize and to scale up. As you're implementing variational inference, here are some tips uh, that I've given to students in the past. So first, write down your derivation, work through the expectations with respect to the variational distribution as we did today, and have your implementation match that derivation exactly. That way you can tell if your implementation is matching what you had on pencil and paper. Of course you need to randomize your initialization, but make sure that you specify a seed. This will allow you to exactly recreate different runs of your algorithms and help you with debugging. What also aids debugging is using simple languages like Python or other scripting languages like R first before you try to speed it up. Often people use variational inference because they want their inference to be faster and so they jump straight to something like C++ which is harder to debug and harder to develop in. Often just switching to variational inference is enough and you don't need to go to a low-level language. If you do need to go to a low-level language, implement it first in a high-level language so that you can make sure that you've gotten it right. And then after you've done that, you can match the implementation between the high-level and the low-level to make sure that the low-level implementation is doing what it needs to do. As you're implementing, make sure that your variable names match what you have on pencil and paper. That way it will be easier to debug and to communicate with people what's going on. As you write your code, create unit tests for each atomic update, i.e. updating a single variational parameter. And then you can write unit tests given a particular configuration of all the other variational parameters. You can tell whether the update for this variational parameter is correct or not. And because this is deterministic, you can explicitly monitor the variational bound. After every variational update, the elbow, the objective function, should increase. If it doesn't, within some numeric tolerance, you have a bug, either in your derivation or in your implementation. So you can put asserts, after every variational update, your likelihood should increase. If it doesn't, something has gone, gone wrong and you need to fix it. The other nice thing about variational inference is that you can save where you are and then just pick up where you left off. 
So this is very useful for checkpointing and debugging. If your code crashes, you can resume where you left off without losing your valuable work. And finally, this is not unique to variational inference, but you should visualize your parameters and make sure that things are developing as you intend. More specific to variational inference is that the digamma function and gamma functions are very expensive to compute. Often they're implemented as a Taylor series approximation in frameworks like sklearn, and you can save yourself quite a bit of time by caching or memoizing these functions. This is because often you're putting in the same arguments to these functions again and again and again. If you keep track of the values, you can greatly speed up your algorithms. So in class, what we'll do is we'll work on a toy LDA problem and work through inference on that and contrast it with what happened with Gibbs sampling. And I'll also talk about some of the ongoing research in variational inference, making algorithms faster and making the models match the computational assumptions of the algorithms.